Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Florida School Shootings, School Safety, Liability, and Special Education. The information presented by the expert is not to be used as legal advice and does not indicate a working relationship with the expert. All materials obtained from this presentation are merely for educational purposes and should not be used in a court of law sans the expert consent, i.e. a business relationship where she or he is hired for your particular case. In today's webinar, Dale will discuss the facts, the lack of accurate understanding of federal law regarding special education, safety issues and management issue, reaction, not prediction, the real problem, poor management of schools, if Parkland, Florida School District violated IDEA in their interaction with Nicholas Cruz, and similarities between Parkland shooting and Sandy Hook, Adam Lanza and Nicholas Cruz. To give you a little background about our presenter, Dale Yeager is a forensic profiler and federal SME with training by the U.S. DOJ and Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. Mr. Yeager is a frequent expert with media outlets, including a featured episode of Forensic Files and a new History Channel series entitled True Monsters. Dale is also a federal law enforcement instructor and SME for the high-intensity drug trafficking areas and Middle Atlantic Great Lakes Organized Crime Law Enforcement Network programs. Attendees to require a passcode, the word for today is liability. During the Q&A session, we ask that you enter this passcode into the Q&A widget for CLE reporting purposes. The Q&A is located to the left of your screen. Please remember that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must log on to your computer as yourself and stay for the full 90 minutes. You are also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. Please note that CLE credit cannot be given to those watching together on a single computer. Tomorrow morning, we will send out an email with a link to the archived recording of the webinar. The slides can be downloaded from the resource list at the bottom of your screen. Thank you all for attending today, and Dale, the presentation is now turned over to you. Thank you very much, Lauren. So today, we're going to talk about uh, a subject that, uh, frankly, I'm tired of talking about after a 25-year career and 30,000 schools that we've worked in, uh, but it's important that we all discuss it. I'm going to address those who are listening, and I'm going to assume that we have attorneys uh, listening to this present or watching this presentation who defend uh, schools, uh, work for school boards. We also have litigation attorneys who litigate actions for uh, on behalf of students against schools. Everything that I present today is relevant to both private and public schools. And uh, also to any, anybody who is uh, watching and listening to this presentation who works in a school environment as an administrator, you're certainly going to want to pay attention to this. So let's talk about Florida. We're going to start there. I have a lot of data I want to share with you, which has been verified. Um, and this is important that we, we start here before we get into the nitty gritty and the, or the meat and potatoes of uh, IDEA and special education and its relationship to school safety. So I'm going to read to you some information about um, Nicholas Cruz, and this is this is very very important. So there were 45 calls for service to the police department relating to Cruz and his brother from 2008 to 2017, not the 23 calls that are claimed in news reports. Um, I looked at the documentation with my team. We found 45 calls, and that's been verified also through some other media sources who, who viewed that. Uh, the problem now is, is that there's a Freedom of Information Act and several lawsuits pending by national media to look at the videotapes, and the school district is refusing to show them, uh, which makes no sense. They're claiming that Nicholas Cruz even though um, he's uh, he's you know incarcerated currently with a pending uh, trial, um, that he has certain rights, and they're using excuses that make no sense. Ultimately, those videotapes are going to tell quite a story, and I'll talk about that as we go through that. Nineteen of the calls were were when Cruz was a child, starting at age nine. Uh, he was there were reports, police reports of violence against his mother numerous times, serious violence against his mother, and animals. An unidentified peer counselor alerted the 
Majority uh, Stoneman Douglas High, High School that Cruz drank gasoline in an attempt to commit suicide and was cutting himself and wished to purchase a gun. Under Florida law, that immediately calls for the peer counselor and anyone who receives that information to immediately call law enforcement and social services because the person is obviously a threat to themselves and to others. That never happened. An investigator with Florida's Department of Children and Families spoke to Cruz but his therapist ultimately advised that he was not currently a threat to himself or others and did not need to be committed. This is egregious. I've worked on these cases. We've, we have a team that has worked on school cases, most of them being special needs students, related to special needs students, over 400 of them. And uh, th this is just egregious behavior. Again, professionals dropping the ball and violating the law. And at some point, they have to be held accountable. The issue of the sheriff's department, that, that's a given. As a federal law enforcement instructor in the United States, I know the troubles in that department. Let's go back to the source. The source is the adults that were around Nicholas Cruz growing up as he grew up, and also the adults that were supposed to care for him under federal and state law in the school environment as well as in social services. And here we have clear evidence of failure and violations of the law. Cruz displayed signs he was deeply troubled even as a toddler. He threw a four-month-old baby into a pool and tried to drown it. The child was crawling on a back porch. Eyewitness reports uh, indicated that Cruz, who was two years old at the time, picked him up and threw him in and tried to drown him and hold him underneath. In eighth grade, he was assigned to a school for students with emotional problems. So ultimately, um, under federal law and under Florida state law with special needs children, based on his age, uh, at eighth grade, he was already in a special school for children with emotional problems. But those of you who are litigators who litigate cases against schools, and we work on both sides. We do defend schools, and we also work on uh, cases that where a school is is uh, defending itself. But ultimately, here's an example of the right hand not speaking to the left. And we see this over and over again. And uh, what we're finding now is that all of these entities that had crews in them were not talking to the next school that received him as a student. And so the data was not being passed along. And this is a very common problem. So next, he had been diagnosed with a string of disorders and conditions, depression, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, emotional behavior, disability, and autism, records from the State Department of Children and Family show. So he had been assessed these disorders, so that means that he fell under IDEA law, and IDEA, which is the federal law, supersedes state law. And we're going to talk later about how these two conflict and how that causes issues with liability uh, with schools and in cases where you're uh, going against a school. He also had hate signs, including a Nazi symbol in the world's, the words, I hate ends, drawn on his book bag. He, he also had Nazi swastikas on his clips. Um, what I find, and I'm a, and as you know, I'm a forensic profiler. That's my real hat. And I will tell you that usually uh, teens, adolescents like this who have these issues, um, end up putting those signs on there just because they're angry. Doesn't necessarily mean they're connected to any white supremacy group, and we found no evidence of that. It's just an it's just a lashing out and being angry. Antifa uh, kids do the same thing; they just do it from a, a different perspective. But um, ultimately, it showed a lot of dysfunction uh, in this in this person. Quote: I looked close and I saw he was holding a dead bird near his genitalia. This uh, witness said, I saw some feathers and I knew that it was a bird. That was disturbing. But I just looked away because it wasn't my business. This was a tipster who called the FBI and he had this dead bird stuck near his groin in a classroom. So the question I have is, wow, that's really poor classroom management. And classroom management, folks, is really key to managing children who have disabilities and children who have emotional problems and certainly preventing school safety issues. And here he was sitting in class the whole time. Later, the same tipster reported that one time Cruz took a dead bird into the kitchen of his home and cut it up, saying he wanted to see 
what the inside looked like. I mean, this this disturbing behavior starts at the age of two. So that brings up another issue, and I'm going to preface my next statement um, with a warning. I do not have time, nor do I care to be to be diplomatic and to be kind to the dead. And I understand that we're supposed to not speak ill of the dead. But over and over again, as my team and I reviewed the data on his mother, we found the father was emotionally disconnected from the whole process when he and his brother were adopted. Uh, They spent in excess of $65,000 to adopt them from a a woman who had no idea who the the, uh, fathers were, was a petty criminal and a drug addict. And this mother coddled and was very codependent, and I'm qualified to say that, very codependent with with Cruz, causing a lot of these issues. And uh, I know that doesn't seem kind for someone who has passed, but we have to talk honestly about this as professionals. We have to look at this dispassionately. <clears throat> there are a lot of a lot of dead children and adults and a lot of people who have injuries that will last them a lifetime who are seeking answers. And we have a responsibility as professionals to talk about this candidly and honestly. So let's get down to the nitty-gritty, and then I'm going to get into the, the, the actual presentation on special needs and school safety and liability. So I'm going to put the blame of this crime at two places. One are the adults. Uh, in his personal life, who refused to intervene aggressively with real professionals, not pop psychologists, who basically said, oh, he's fine, there's no big deal, Uh, this whole Carl Rogers Maslow uh, mentality of everybody is okay and they're just uh, needing some love. And secondly, I put it at the fact that this school system was a huge supporter so was the Sheriff's Department of the Promise Program. So many of you do not know what the Promise Program is, but I will tell you as a professional who works for the federal government and who has been in education as well as law enforcement for 25 years, I will tell you that the Promise Program is one of the worst ideas ever to come down the pike from Washington, D.C., and that's saying a lot. And there is evidence, and I believe it, I believed it when I knew that they had used this program, and there's now evidence from the Manhattan Institute that this was had a direct connection to these to this crime. So the Promise Program was a Department of Justice federal grant program under the Obama administration. Basically, it was designed by people who had no understanding of criminal justice or education, and it has caused nothing but heartache and pain and problems. And it is directly connected in numerous places to violent behavior. So the idea is that you give money to local police departments and school districts to ignore certain crimes, both misdemeanors and felonies done by adolescents. And so the whole concept behind this was, well, we're going to stop this school to prison pipeline, which I can, I can tell you right now uh, really doesn't exist. It's, it's political jibber jabber. It's not really based on any kind of fact. It's people's uneducated opinions, frankly, because we're down there in 20 states in rural, suburban, and urban uh, school districts on a weekly basis for the last two decades, and we see that that is just not the case. There are many other factors that have nothing to do with, uh, with schools. And so this program basically said, hey, you ignore these things. And then what you're going to do is you're going to do peer mediation and you're going to do restorative justice, another bad idea. And you're going to work with these kids. Well, the problem was that you can intervene aggressively with children who are extremely violent, as in the case of Cruz, if you're going to keep ignoring it and ignoring it. And let me remind you, let me remind you back here that he was cutting himself. He tried to commit suicide and he wanted to purchase guns. And yet, and yet, his own therapist said he wasn't a danger. And this is the mentality that the Promise Program has brought to educators, and sadly, in many cases, to law enforcement, which is, hey, you don't deal with those things. Now, let me give you an example of how bad this is. 
I teach four things for the federal government's Justice Department HIDA program. One of them is sex crimes investigation by youth and adults. So crimes committed by adolescents as well as adults, both male and female. I'm going to tell you something. Right now, Mayor de Blasio in New York City has decided that he is not going to arrest people who jump turnstiles. He is going to ignore misdemeanors. Well, there's a problem with that. For the past 70 years, let me repeat that, 70 years, there is actual empirical data studies that show that people that jump a turnstile that do trespassing and breaking and entering are sex offenders. I've been teaching this for 20 years. So what's happening is now the police are pushing back, and I'm an NYPD detective division instructor for NYPD. They are trying to explain to the mayor the people that jump the turnstiles are the ones who are more than likely doing the rapes and sex assaults. We're catching, we're, we're, we have a correlation between the two. And I understand the correlation is not causation, but in this case, we have the evidence. So when you don't deal with minor issues, then they become major issues. And there's where the Promise Program is at the heart of this. So let me read a, a statement that just came out from the Manhattan Institute, which is a respected scientific research center. The facts pattern that has emerged strongly suggest that the Promise Program played a role in this crime with Cruz. So we come to the next issue, and then, I'll, uh, and then we're going to start talking specifically about IDEA. The U.S. Rehabilitation Act of 1973, the first law that articulated a federal role in enforcing the rights of disabled people, the laws surrounding the education of children with special needs have evolved from that law in 73. So IDEA is really an extension of the U.S. Rehabilitation Act of 73, which is still in play. And so this is important for you as attorneys to understand. In general, school districts are required to provide kids with physical, emotional, and intellectual disabilities a free education in the least restrictive setting and to accommodate the needs of, of such students. Well, as you look at the pattern of behavior as it comes out more and more, the school district did not do that. Uh, it was complete chaos in how they dealt with, with Cruz. And here we are talking about a serious mass shooting, um, which is being politicized. And I, I don't take either side. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a, a Democrat. Um, but the, the issue is that we have to look deeper than that. So let's start by talking about the issues. Lauren, my slide is not working, not advancing. Is this slide you wanted? Is this slide you wanted? I'm trying to get to two and it's not advancing for some reason. Weird. Hmm. Yeah, my slides are not moving forward. Huh. What's the title of the Sorry, slide? Sorry, everyone. I'm trying to get to two, number two of 16. So high liability issues with the management. Yeah. It's not moving forward. Can you move it from your side, Lauren? Sorry, everyone. We'll we'll be moving it's here in a minute. Push to the audience. Push to the audience. So right now, there's uh, high liability issues with the management of special needs. Yeah, I can't. I can't see it on my screen. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. I can't read it. That's weird. Okay. Um, all right. Let me see if I can do it from here. I can't. Can't see it. Okay. So let me. Let's move on. Sorry about the technical issues. Um, so, okay, so let's talk about high liability issues with the management of special needs students. So facts, 
The U.S. Department of Education estimates that over the next five years, 60% of all K-12 students will be special needs. So the reason why uh, they figured this out in their research was that ultimately um, much of ADA was changed in the last two years and has uh, basically uh, pushed, pe pushed people to a point where 80% of all Americans can apply for disability. And if you look at the numbers of adults uh, and, and adolescents uh, signing up for disability, it's, it's grown tremendously uh, because of that change. ADA has an effect on IDEA because they're all part of the same uh, basic unit of, uh, of law. And this is a very important issue, but there is, a, there is a discussion that's been going on for several years, and it's coming to a head, uh, where there is going to be a new way of assessing uh, students for special needs, which I think personally and professionally is an important uh, thing to do. And that may change dramatically so that they are put into specialized groups. But the one thing that we do know is the fastest growing student disability is autism. Autism has a range. So you have Asperger's syndrome, which a lot of famous people have, and, and they do fine with it. It can be managed pretty well uh, because it's a low spectrum kind of autism. And then you have severe forms of autism where uh, a, a child has to be taken care of 24 seven. Juveniles account for one third of all sex offenders. Female juveniles are the fastest growing group of sex offenders. So female juveniles are now growing at a tremendous rate in, in sex offense, both in the U.S. and Canada. And you say, well, why would you bring this up in, in special needs? Because we're finding that most of these female juvenile sex offenders who, by the way, first offend when they're babysitting are actually special needs students in school. And what's happening is, is that they're not being managed correctly. And so, according to the U.S. Department of Education, about 80% of all sex assaults over the past 10 years in private and public schools are actually in special education uh, divisions of schools. So there is a serious issue going on with the management of special needs students, how they're assessed, and the kind of and types of crimes that are being committed. And so this is very important to understand these, these, uh, uh, th this, this information and this data. And I put at the bottom of that slide where you can get that information. I would really strongly urge you, if you're doing any kind of school legal work or if you're a school administrator, to sign up for, this, uh, for these bulletins and this data. They'll email it to you and, and stay current on what's going on. Let's talk about crime in school facilities so that you can understand it in context. 2.7 million crimes are committed at schools every year in America. Now, what's interesting is about 73% of that 2.7 million, 73% are in suburban and rural schools. So let's talk about Florida and Sandy Hook at this point. So in 2000, the White House asked us to come in and asked me to put together a research team, and we did a report uh, for the White House and the Senate Judiciary Committee called um, the School Safety in America. And we, we, we did a study, found all the issues, and then addressed that to the Senate Judiciary Committee. We ended up doing three of those reports over a period of seven years. And then when Sandy Hook happened, we got a call again from the Senate asking, hey, could you do an investigation, find out what, what the real story is about Sandy Hook? And what we found there was evidence of about six different violations of federal special ed law. You may ask, well, why did that not become a big issue? Well, it's because it became a political football. Because what it required, this evidence of violation, which is a felony of IDEA, would have required the indictment of multiple school officials at Sandy Hook. And nobody had the political will to do it. They talked a lot about healing, but not a lot about justice. And so what's happening is, is that in Sandy Hook, the school system there, as well as the school system in Florida, are very much alike. They, we see them all the time. These are um, upper middle class, wealthier suburban school systems. And basically, they really do not have the mentality that this is going to happen here. They are the worst of the worst and the, the problem is, is that they, they believe that somehow because of money and because they pay high taxes, that somehow crime, 
just doesn't touch them. And this kind of uh, common sense deficit really puts them at risk. And this is, this is a problem that we see over and over again. So if you think about it, 73% of these crimes committed in schools are not happening in urban schools, but happening in rural and suburban schools. Students ages 12 through 18 were more likely to be victims of non-fatal violent crimes such as rape, sexual assault, robbery, and aggravated assault. Total crimes committed in schools of this age group are 253,000. Of that number, 60% are suburban and rural schools. Again, not an urban issue, primarily a suburban and rural issue. Teachers are the victims of over 400,000 violent crimes each year. And this is something nobody talks about. They don't talk about it because, and I'm not anti-union, but teachers' union leadership have told me we don't need to be promoting that because we have our own issues. We have enough issues. We don't need to be talking about that issue. Ironically, the number three most likely person to commit a violent crime against a teacher is a school staff member, which, is, which brings up an issue of, of the failure of human resources, which we see over and over again in school districts to hire good people and manage good people. So this is, this is what's going on in, in schools. And by the way, 30% of our school clients are private. And I can tell you they have the same exact problems, and in some cases more problems in certain areas than, than public schools. But yet the perception is that everything is, is better in a, in a private school. Educationally, it may be better, but the security and safety issues are just the same. Lack of accurate understanding of federal law regarding special education. So IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, is very specific. It can get complicated, but I will tell you that the people at the Department of Ed have specialists who speak plain English, and if you ask, they will assist you in understanding those rules. But here's what we find. You are required by federal law as a school system, both public and private, to do a climate assessment of your special education department. This is hardly ever done. We do them all the time for schools, and they're always shocked by the kind of questions they're asked. And one of the things we ask in the climate assessment is, where do you get your information about changes in special education law, IDEA? All the time, not some of the time, but all the time, they say, well, we get it from the State Department of Education. So if they're in Virginia, they get it from the Virginia Department of Education or the New Hampshire Department. Here's the problem. Over and over again, you will see that there is a conflict between state special ed law and federal special ed law. And that difference is causing a new trend over the last five years. More and more attorneys are not going to superior court. They are going to federal court for their clients who are students and getting, getting these cases adjudicated in federal court, and which is a smart tactical move because the cases move faster and they can use federal law because the federal law always trumps state law, especially on special education. The worst conflict between state law and federal law is in New Jersey. New Jersey, many years ago, created something called HIB, Harassment, Intimidation, and Bullying Law. I was there when they presented it to the superintendents uh, for the state because I was asked to be the second speaker. It was a fun day, let me tell you. And they were angry. The superintendents were angry because what had happened was somebody got the bright idea in Trenton to take adult civil rights law and apply it to children. Well, there's a problem with that because back in the 1980s, the Supreme Court ruled on this um, and said, and I quote, children do not enjoy the same civil rights as adults in schools because otherwise we cannot protect them. And so HIB is in conflict with federal law and it creates a lot of chaos, a lot of chaos for a lot of people um, who have to manage these special needs children. One of the things that's very important is that you keep up to date on IDEA law from the U.S. Department of Education so that you don't get it filtered. We see it over and over again that on uh, in the state information, the State Departments of Education information, we see it watered down or pieces taken out. Um, you have to get it directly from the source. And this is where a lot of school districts fail and why they lose a lot of these cases. One of the things that has to be taught 
to staff and administrators is the disciplinary rule changes because they change pretty routinely. Also, they have to understand the procedural safeguards. All of that is related to school safety. But yet, a lot of times when we ask the special ed directors, they are only briefing the superintendents. They aren't even going before the school board and educating the school board or the school board attorney as to these policy changes by the federal in the federal law. And this is a disconnect and it causes a liability bomb, as we call it. Safety issues, a management issue. So I was a student of Dr. Peter Drucker for 15 years. Those of you who know that name know the importance of that man. I learned a lot from him. Those of you who don't know who he is, he is the man who invented modern management practice. And I know that sounds boring, but he was a very important person received the highest honor that a U.S. citizen can get from the President of the United States. And one of the things that Dr. Drucker used to drive home to us was that you manage what you can measure. And he distinguished between management and leadership. And I remember him saying to me one time, he said, I'm not training you to be a manager. A manager is just a robot that moves paper around. I'm training you to be a leader. And a leader does what is good for the organization, but generally unpopular with the workers. And he said, if you're, if you're loved by your workers, there's something dramatically wrong with your leadership. And I know that sounds harsh, but I'm telling you it's true. And this is an issue. We have people running school systems that have no management or leadership training at all. I was in a school yesterday, an elementary ed school. So this is K to K to uh, five, fifth grade, they have over 800 children in that school, and they have 45 staff members. That's a small village. So basically, they are running a small town. And the good news was they had good management skills, but this is a problem. If you don't know how to manage people, both adults and children, you're going to be failure. It, it, this is where the failures come, and this is what happened, in my professional opinion, at Sandy Hook and in Florida. Special education staff are generally not trained in the emergency management of special needs students. This is a huge issue. When you pull the emergency plan, is there a special section on special needs children? For example, if you try to pick up a child who has autism, generally what's going to happen, I've been there, I've done this, I've been in three schools, had major emergencies. One, a gas line blew up and two got hit by tornadoes. I was there, I was helping out, I saw what was going on. This is in theory to me. And when you try to pick up these small children that don't want to be picked up, if you're a parent, you know they feel like they're 600 pounds. And so you have to know how to approach them. You have to know how to talk to their unconscious mind. You have to know how to calm them down and get them to cooperate. That requires training. And we see it over and over again. The special education staff are not trained on how to deal with those special needs students in an emergency management situation. So now you have an emergency, which is a liability issue in many cases, and then you have another liability issue because some special needs child got hurt because the staff was not trained. The emergency plan was lacking. It did not have a special section that required yearly training for staff on how to assist the special needs department in handling those children. So that brings us to policy updates. If you're an attorney defending a school system, working for a school board, you have a responsibility and you should be sitting down and you should look at those emergency plans and the school safety plans and say to yourself, are they current with current updates to IDEA? Are they current with state uh, emergency and safety planning requirements? Uh, are they current? Because if they're not, that document becomes a problem. Another issue we see just on a side note with emergency plans is the laziness of some school administrators to take someone else's emergency plan, copy and paste it, and make it their own. I'm going to tell you something. Uh, you have got to take an emergency plan and you've got to customize it to your school system and, your, and each individual school. Because, for example, if you're if one school building in your school system is a California-style flat roof school, that's going to require a different type of emergency management than one that is four stories tall, made of brick, 
built at the turn of the 20th century that has very large glass windows. The style of the school, where it's located, what's its footprint, all of that has to be customized. You can't copy and paste somebody else's uh, rules. And this is something you need to be looking at both to protect the school system and uh, for those of you who are plaintiff attorneys who are filing actions against schools on behalf of students, you need to be looking at that. Are they taking the easy way out or are they doing it professionally and correctly? And by the way, some of that can be done, of course, with the help of local law enforcement and fire rescue, but a lot of that has to be done with school administrators and special education directors. They have to be involved in that because, again, it's for a school environment. And there are laws that have to be uh, appropriated, appropriated accordingly. Next. Poor management of students, the real problem. I'm going to advance the slides so we're on the right slides here. I hope that's the right one. I'm sorry for the technical issues. So let's talk about the IEP issue. We cannot find any reference at all in all the documents that were released, um, all the documents, all the data that's out there, the evidence out there about the specifics of the IEP um, related to Mr. Cruz. So an IEP is an individual education plan. This is required to be designed. It, it has very specific rules. And it is a very important document because it is a very much a school safety document. Because in the IEP, there is management of the student, oversight of the student. Uh, it deals with all of the student's issues, uh, like the ones that Mr. Cruz had. And part of the IEP issue under IDEA, the federal law, I'll just call it the federal special ed law, is the behavioral manifestation determination. This is where you find an extraordinary amount of issues uh, where you have staff, and I've found, actually, um, many school board members and special ed directors don't even understand the guidelines for a BMD, Behavioral Manifestation Determination. And what this basically is, to make it in simple terms, is, is the behavior, the negative behavior, uh, or problem behavior of the student related to their disability, or is it related to cognitive ability to just be rebellious? And here's where we have the problem. It's called the information disconnect. About 45 years ago, yeah, probably, yeah more like 40, 45 years ago, the world started to move towards what's called modern psychology. Now, I have my own issues with this. We don't have time to go into that, nor do you want to hear it. But it has caused a lot of problems. The two primary people, which most of you will recognize from school and college, are Carl Rogers and Maslow, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. I'm going to just focus on Carl Rogers right now. And so what has happened is Rogers became very, very important in education. So John Dewey, the father of American education, was the person who really set out the process of educating children in the early part of the 20th century in America. He's considered the father of American education, and rightly so, but this was a problematic human being. Um, first of all, he spent many years in the Soviet Union and was a big fan of communist schools. Um, and I'm not saying that from a political perspective, but he had some very odd ideas. And those odd ideas brought in people that had the same odd ideas as him, and one of them is Carl Rogers. And so what has happened is, is that in the last 15 years specifically, sociology and psychology have started to move away from the empirical data model. Stick with me. This is important to understand. So we all went to school. We all learned basic sixth-grade science. You know, empirical data, observable, replicable data. Water is the base, say, has the same basic chemical makeup all over the world. May have different other ingredients, but to make water, it's the same around the world. That's observable and replicable. Well, psychology, modern psychology and sociology, started moving away from that model, and they moved away for a real specific reason, because the empirical scientific studies were disproving their theories. 
which were crazy to begin with. So they started to move to peer studies. Basically, that means that if 100 people all agree on the same bad idea, they considered it science. And this is where we're at today. So one of the things I will tell you as a plaintiff attorney representing a student is don't accept the behavioral manifestation determination assessment of the special ed director or the IEP team. Challenge it and say, wait a minute. Are you, how can you prove that this is related to the person's disability? How about if it's a personality disorder? And one of the best ways to do that is to demand this. Every student who has a, who is considered special needs should be required to go through a full physical with blood work to eliminate any kind of physical anomaly that would explain their behavior. This is very, very important. Very important. And this is where people are, are, are failing. So there is a tactic that you can take with you and use. Very important because a personality disorder is not a mental illness. I mean, I, I, I deal with a lot of violent offenders, very, very violent offenders. And most of them are not mentally ill. They have personality disorders. They're angry. They're hateful. Uh, they're sociopathic or psychopathic. None of those are mental illnesses. Those are personality disorders versus a physical disability. And this is where the disconnect comes. And those of you who are attorneys representing school boards, you need to sit down with the school board and you need to sit down with the special education director and work this out because this will become an issue. And frankly, we all have an ethical responsibility to these kids to make sure that we understand this. Parents and disability assessments, not my child. It is very common in the United States, very common for parents to refuse refuse to allow uh, their children to be assessed. It's a very, very common problem. And that's a big issue. It's a big, big issue. Because what happens is these kids are not served, uh, they're not helped, and they go on to be 20-something-year-olds who end up doing either negative things to themselves or to others in the case of, of Mr. Cruz. And so it's very important to understand this issue in context. And then many times we don't, we, don't, we don't know the totality of it. And I'm always glad when TASA says, hey, come on and do this, do this presentation because we want to educate as to what's really going on here. Because this is so, so important. And so lastly, I'm going to leave a lot of time for questions because normally on this we have a lot of questions. So the last thing I would say is, well, you know, you have to ask some really difficult questions. Is the special education staff, are they, are they trained? Are, the, are, the, are the, uh, the staff in general trained? Are the administrators trained? You know, are the, are the plans for safety and emergency preparedness, are they up to date? How are they getting their updates? Have they had a federal level climate assessment? These are scary questions to ask a school system because in many cases, they're going to fail in all regards. But folks, ultimately, I've seen too many dead bodies of children. I've seen it over and over again. And it's disturbing as a father. It's disturbing because they don't need to happen. I'm very frustrated when I hear people, and, I, and, and I'll open up for questions, very, very frustrated when I hear people use the statement, which is, you know, really frustrating to me. The statement that of random acts of violence, I can tell you that that is not true and there's no such thing. I know it's hard to believe. I know it's counterintuitive, but bear with me. In 1998, the U.S. Department of Justice did a study. The study looked at all crime in the United States, rape, robbery, murder, domestic violence, everything. And they asked one question. They said, what percentage of these crimes could be prevented and how? And they found that all crimes could be prevented between 92 and 96 percent of all crimes could be prevented. And they listed how. And so we have the empirical data that says, yes, there's, there's generally no one wakes up one morning and decides to kill people. It's over a period of time. And in the case of Mr. Cruz, you have failure after failure from two years old on failure after failure of adults who were close to him, not doing their job, not doing their job. 
and then eventually we get to the school. The police department, it's, it's caving, it's falling apart, uh, the Broward County Sheriff's Department, because of the lack of leadership on the part of the sheriff, lack of, of application of training. Uh, that's, that's, that's a given. But here we're professionals saying over and over again, uh, there's a problem with this child, there's a problem with this person, and then others coddling and codependent with, with Mr. Cruz, including his therapist, including his mother. And then ultimately, where we're concerned, the school officials were not doing their jobs. They were basically taking Mr. Cruz and they were pushing him into this program or that so they didn't have to deal with him. I've seen it many times in my career, many, many times. And that's just sad. I don't ask a lot of people. I just ask that you act like an adult and be a professional. There's no other, there's no other thing that I ask of people. And here we have the responsibility of adults to take care of someone else's child. And most of you are listening either have children or grandchildren that are in some type of education situation. And you expect, you hope, you pray that these adults are taking care of your children or your grandchildren. We all have that that uh, attitude, that thinking. Well, in this case, they failed along with others. And uh, it didn't need to happen. It is not, it's not a given. It can be prevented. We've seen it numerous times. So now what I'll do is I'm going to, uh, I still can't see my uh, slides, Lauren, but um, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren to feed me the questions that all of you have. I'll answer them as best I can. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are now entering the Q&A session. During this time, please enter the passcode, which is liability. You may also enter any questions that you have for Dale. First question we have, I understand why the school did what they did, i.e. promise program, but why did the sheriff play along? Because the grant from the Department of Justice is shared between the police department and the school system. So a school is called an LEA, local education agency. That's the federal term for it. Police departments, all police departments in the United States get block grants from the Justice Department. So this was part of a block grant program. So the sheriff played along uh, because the sheriff was a big promoter of the Promise program politically. The sheriff's a very political entity. Um, and um, And the school system was a big promoter of it. And so they were uh, 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 co-teamed on this promise program. I mean, that's that's, uh, the bottom line. It's pretty simple to understand. So, And by the way, real quickly before you go to the next question, for those of you who do not understand this, and if you do, I, I apologize for repeating something you know, but in the northeastern part of the United States and generally in the eastern part of the Midwest, Police departments are run by police chiefs. In the South and in the West, they are run by sheriffs. So in the Northeast, generally, sheriffs are county, and they are um, they basically transport prisoners. But in this, in certain parts of the South and the West, the sh- county sheriff is the boss, and they can only be removed generally by the governor. They, it's a very powerful position. So. Law enforcement in the United States is very um, different depending on where you are. And I just wanted to share that with those who didn't know that. So what's the next question, Lauren? Who are the viable defendants, both state and federal actors, in the Florida shootings? Would you repeat that again? I'm sorry. Who are the viable defendants, both state and federal actors, in the Florida shootings? Well, it would be the um, special ed director of the school system, uh, certainly the sheriff's department in general, uh, the school board of the school system, the therapist, um, who was his personal therapist. Um, all of you know what downstream liability is. Um, you draw a line and you start adding people like leaves on a, on a vine. Um, but those are the primaries. The people that violated the law. The law is very clear in all 50 states. And what I still don't understand, and just on a side note, all of you know about the Aurora movie theater shooting. And here you have a psychiatrist, 
I believe she was a psychiatrist at the university who had this book and had evidence that this person was a danger to themselves and to others, the shooter in the Aurora Theater shooting, and yet violated the law. And then uh, I don't remember any evidence that the county attorney or the district attorney in this case tried to um, have her indicted for violation of the law. And, um, and, as, and I remember specifically that the university protected her from that, even though she was required by law to report this, this person. Would that have stopped him? I think so. I think that would have put him in the system. Some people need to be in the system so they can be managed and controlled. It's the only way to, con- to stop this type of thing. I've seen it time and time again. So that's a side, a side point. But back to the original question of liability, you have the school system in general. You have the therapist. You have anybody who evaluated him, saw him make the statements he made, saw him try to commit suicide, saw the, the, any activity that required them under Florida state law to report him. The other issue is that at some point someone's got to put a subpoena together through a judge to say, we want to see the IEP. We want to see all the file on this student. We want to see exactly what the school system did. And I'm going to tell you that more than likely you're going to see even more evidence of bad behavior. And I'm I'm basing that on one thing, that they will not release those videotapes. Very unusual, by the way, for a school not to do that. Very common for them to release tapes to the police. Uh, They can't They can't release those tapes, and the police are fighting, too, to not release the tapes. And why? Makes no sense. But but liability can be spread around quite a bit in this process, quite a bit, to multiple people. Next question. What should a layperson do when seeing the types of behavior that precede violence? Well... Listen, that a lay person, I mean, if you're talking about, um, you know, ch- children, um, children and adolescents, uh, all 50 states have some type of child endangerment law. And I'll paraphrase. Um, if you see a child being harmed psychologically or physically, you must intervene you, or you must call police. So it's pretty simple, I think. Um, pr- pretty simple stuff. So I don't think it's. I don't think it's complicated. You know, do the right thing. And in we do see police departments that are dysfunctional um, and they don't do their job. And that's that's where the um, a state attorney has to come in and step in when they're not doing their job. Because the local police, as you all know, are under the uh, direction of the district attorney or the county attorney. So... Um, Really, it always ends up at one person who's ultimately responsible for not taking action. So, Next question. If there is a list of preventative measures that can be taken at schools, why isn't this made to be mandatory? Well, because we have a unique situation in the United States. We are the only country in the world with locally elected school boards. No one else has that system anywhere in the world. And so under a federalist concept of of government, we have state rights and we have local government. And so what happens is that local governments cling to control of their schools um, and states, you know, also cling to control of their schools uh, like grim death. Um, Is that important? Well, now we're talking civics and politics. I think it's important, but I think there needs to be a balance. Um, So the U.S. Department of Education has the the um, recommended recommendations that we designed in the early 2000s at the request of the president and and Ted Kennedy and the Senate Judiciary Committee. They can only recommend them. They can't force you to use them. However, The one thing that the U.S. Department of Education has the power over is how you treat special ed students under IDEA. That's where local and state governments do not have um, options. They must follow that law. Do they follow it? Very rarely. It's, uh, It's a serious problem, so... 
Did any successful plaintiff suits come out of Sandy Hook or Columbine? Yes, they did. And what happens is, for those of you who don't know, schools are generally insured through subfunds. So a subfund is a group of schools are all putting their money together. Um, when a payout has to be made, it's spread out. Um, uh, it's spread out over all of the uh, the accounts. Whatever is not used at the end of the school year is returned to the schools, and they keep revolving through it. So, uh, most in the case of Sandy Hook, I believe the payouts were somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 million. The problem is the payouts. No, nothing went to court. They all settled. I wish they had gone to court and revealed this information because I think it would have really prevented a lot of the problems that we're having now, like Florida, because parents really have no idea how bad it is. They really have no idea. And it needs to be revealed. And um, that frustrates me that that's never gone to court. Um, so what happens is people get tired. They just want to move on. They're grieving, and so they settle, and that's the case um, at Sandy Hook and uh, out in Colorado. What do you do with a student who does not have a mental illness, but rather a personality disorder? How can you treat the latter? I don't understand the term treat. Are you talking about treat medically or treat management-wise? Um, I guess this question is addressing both perhaps. Okay. Well, I'll talk about school management. So a, a child with a personality disorder falls usually under learning disabilities. So their your your ability to discipline them and manage them really has very few uh, restrictions compared to one a child that falls under IDEA, um, and that and that's a that's an issue related to school management and. If you have good managers in place, they call them school administrators. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, a principal is called a school administrator. Um, people that run departments are school administrators. The school administration is, you know, basically those above the teachers and the paraprofessionals. So um, the management of those students doesn't have restrictions. And um, in the last couple of years, IDA was changed to allow discipline of special needs children under IDEA almost the same as a regular uh, student. So they really haven't had much difference between the two. How does one find out if a district is a participant in the PROMISE program? Oh, they'll, they'll, they'll promote it right on their website. It's not hard to figure out. And also, the Department of Justice um, has a page um, listing their grant reciproc reciproc. Yes, those who receive the grants. I'm having a hard time speaking today. Those who have received that grant for the Promise Program are listed. That's public knowledge, so pretty easy to find out. Next question: Did Cruz enter the school building via an unlocked door? Why was the door unlocked? Well, you have, at the beginning of the school day, at the end of the school day, you have ingress, students coming in, and egress, students going out. Um, the, the, the bigger, I don't know the specifics of that because of the restriction by the school system and the sheriff's department with, uh, with, with those facts, um, which is why the, fed, the feds and the state have to get involved. But the bigger question is this. A... Um, an AR-15 is uh, almost a four-foot-long rifle. Um, there was a no trespass letter. There was a no trespass notice on crews. Now, that's just words on paper unless you have someone specifically outside to monitor to make sure he's not there. Nobody was monitoring for him. And the question, the real question is, you can't pack that in a, in a, in a backpack. So how in the world did he get in with something that large? So I'm going to give you a suggestion. Um, one of the things that's been recommended since Columbine is a walk around. You have to have someone outside 
walking around that does not need, need to be a security person, and they need to be walking around at least every hour. Our school systems that we work with, they do it every 30 minutes with volunteers from the staff. They have two-way radio. They see something or someone that shouldn't be there. They radio. The lockdown occurs. Police come. It's a great system. You cannot uh, prevent something from hurting your school if you're not looking for it. And here you had a, a situation, again, a suburban school that did not uh, do the protocols that are suggested. And by the way, in any liability, any kind of uh, legal action, that's going to be a major issue. Why didn't you follow the U.S. Department of Education recommendations? Because someone walking outside uh, with a radio would have noticed him. He was, what, he was easy to spot. Why did that not happen? And then you have a situation with the delay in the video camera feed. That's a whole issue unto itself. You talk about a safety issue. You talk about a liability bomb, as I call them. That, 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 that uh, video system being delayed, what a huge issue. What a huge issue. All right, the next question. What specifically should be done to link these behavioral problems to purchase of a gun or special attention to potential shooters? Well, you know, that's that's really a public policy question, and we're, we're focusing today on special ed. I will just say that, um, you know, the the issue, the problem is that the current laws as they are do work effectively. The problem has been what we all saw after 9-11, the right hand's not talking to the left. And so people that have these issues, um, if they're in the system, uh, they're going to pop up in a background check. Well, why did Mr. Cruz not pop up in a background check? Because his therapist said, well, he's not a danger to anybody, even though he tried to commit suicide. He's he's uh, trying to drown children. He's hurting animals. He's beating the living daylights out of his mother. Um, so when adults fail to do their job, um, the system breaks down because the data is not there to prevent them from purchasing a weapon. Um, I am, however, uh, I do believe that you have to be, you should have to be 21 to have a semi-automatic um, uh, pistol or rifle. That's just my personal opinion. Um, but, you know, I think you shouldn't be able to drive until you're 21, but that's because I'm a parent. But anyway, moving on. Next question. How does one get a school district such as Philadelphia to recognize that restorative justice is more than coddling, if it works at all. Well, you have to, you know, the, the data is out there. It's been, it's been well studied. Restorative justice has been well studied. It has its critics. And these are very uh, smart people, much smarter than me, uh, who have done the research and show that it really doesn't prevent anything. Basically, it just, it allows uh, juveniles to keep committing uh, you know, anti-authority behavior and, and socially unacceptable behavior and criminal behavior, and people keep giving them excuses. You know, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. You know, it's interesting when the Catholic sex scandal came became a big issue. One of the things we knew about this, because we had been working with the Catholic Church back in the 90s uh, on this very issue before it became nationally known. And one of the things I said to the bishops was, I said, you, your universities are big fans of Carl Rogers, and what, they're, what, what is happening in these therapy sessions is they are telling the priests who are doing this that it's not their fault. They're just immature sexually. I said, well, that's a problem. That kind of pop psychology is, is, is giving them uh, an excuse to behave in a criminal way rather than holding them accountable for doing right and wrong. And that's the problem with restorative justice. It's it's really based on some very odd theories, uh, and I'm being diplomatic here. I said I wasn't going to be, but um, I'm really a, not a fan of it at all. And promise is just an extension of that. So, would the promise program absolve liability here? No, it's it's actually it's actually at the root of the liability. Um, in my professional opinion of the school, that they allowed this to be used, that the sheriff's department agreed with it. And the idea, I mean, imagine telling a jury, hey, the federal government gave this school system and the sheriff's department federal money to ignore 
um, misdemeanors and certain types of felonies of juveniles. I mean, what would a jury react to that? How would a jury react to that? Um, this is just a, a bad idea, and it allowed people to make excuses and to not deal with Cruz's issues and ultimately not be in the system. You know, here were, here were 40 plus visits related to him, and, and, and he was committing felonies as an 18 year old, and yet they were not arresting him. This, this, is, this is what we have allowed ourselves to, to do in American education, allowing people, I call them professional yentas, yentas, um, Yiddish for busybodies, professional yentas who come with their wacky theories and their ideas. And I'm not talking politically here, but just dumb ideas that make no sense and giving people um, excuses for bad behavior and not holding them accountable. And um, I see it over and over again as the cause of these shootings. Certainly it was in Sandy Hook. Same problem. That was, oh, my goodness, that family, uh, that family, you know, was so dysfunctional and so codependent and so problematic and so connected to that crime, but we're not talking about that today. What's the next question? All of the state actors who you mention as defendants are covered in aggregate by $200,000 in state sovereign immunity caps. Are there any private non-governmental defendants? Well, here's the deal. Uh, we, we deal with this, um, the cover, the, the uh, caps in a lot of states that we work in. And one of the things I would say is that, first of all, the cap is not relevant to criminal behavior. So um, in every state, you know, we have um, obstruction of justice charges, which are a felony. And um, a lot of times what needs to happen is that when evidence is presented, I mean, you're all, you know, uh, you're as attorneys, you are responsible to report anything to the court where there's a broke a law that's been broken um, that you find uh, not you know not related to your client of course but ultimately um, here's where you need to start to, we need to start saying to state attorneys to um, you know law enforcement entities a crime has been committed and we're asking for an investigation we want it investigated we do it quite a bit as a as a private company because of what we find and plus the fact that all of us uh, have some type of federal clearance because we still work um, as advisors and SMEs for, for federal agencies, so we're required to report crime. But uh, there are ways to deal with that. However, um, you know, the, the, the private entities, uh, one of the questions you need to, to find out is do they have a private security company uh, that provides security guards? Because normally those are vendor. They're hired by the school district. Um, Certainly, they failed to do their job if they were there. Um, there are a lot of private entities. The therapist is more than likely private, obviously. Uh, so it's just a matter of doing some some legal expert research. That's all. How effective is treatment? Oh, sorry. How effective is treatment for personality disorders? How does it differ from treatment of mental illness? Well, personality disorders um, are actually more difficult to treat than mental illness because mental illness like schizophrenia, uh, generally you're talking about lithium based kind of uh, drugs or some some pretty serious drugs to control that, depending on the severity. Um, in the case of personality disorders, a personality disorder is a nice way of saying in general sociopathic or psychopathic behavior. So psychopathic be, psychopaths are violent loner types. Uh, sociopaths are violent leader types. Um, and so this is, uh, it's very difficult to get people to change that behavior, especially after children reach puberty. There's more than enough research on this, by the way. Um, most of it done by Duke University back in the day. And, uh, once they sexualize their violence, meaning they've gone through puberty and they find sexual excitement, I'm, I'm sorry to talk about this, but you have to understand it, uh, it's very hard for people to stop doing that. That's why people have relatives who are so narcissistic and aggressive till the day they die, 
very hard for people with personality disorder to get away from that. And personality disorders are really at the heart of much of uh, addiction issues. Um, you know, everybody talks about genetics, but that that research is flawed. And frankly, there's not a lot of evidence of the genetic connection like people think. A lot of it is just personality disorders, primarily uh, severe narcissism. So, um, yeah, personality disorder is a much much more difficult issue to treat than a mental illness. Next question. Do you see teachers being armed with concealed carry weapons as being a potential solution or a bigger liability exposure? Well, <laughs> I knew that question was going to come up. So in South Korea, Germany, Austria, Sweden, there's a lot of countries around the world that for, for several decades they arm principals. Uh, it's very common practice around the world. Uh, here, because firearms are a big political issue, um, it depends on where you go. For example, the school resource officer, which is a program that we support, and I understand that Broward had SROs, um, but I'm going to tell you right now that the the SRO that w did not go into the school, the, the, the famous Peterson, uh, really wasn't a true SRO. Um, SROs are specially trained through the federal COPS program. And this is something as attorneys you need to find out whether you're defending a school or you have a, you're a plaintiff attorney. You need to find out if they really were trained through the Justice Department COPS program. Some schools just call them SROs and they're not really officially SROs. And that's a liability problem. As far as arming people, um, about 200,000 Teachers, administrators, school staff in the United States have carry permits. So, um, you know, if you allow them to carry in the school, there you go. You have armed teachers. I don't think it's necessary. I'd rather see SROs doing that work. The problem is the pushback uh, for school resource officers is primarily in the upper Midwest and northeastern parts of the United States, California, Places that tend to lean to the left politically, they have a real big issue with it. Um, I will tell you this as a side note on this arming issue. Please, if you are an attorney for a school board, please listen to me carefully. There is a federal law and there are state laws. Your school board is not allowed to disarm a police officer. If the police officer is a sworn police officer, you cannot tell them not to wear a gun when they enter your school. And that includes juvenile probation. That includes anyone that is legally allowed to carry a firearm as a part of law enforcement or criminal justice. You cannot disarm them. That is illegal. And that aggravates me to no end because you're taking away their ability to defend themselves. So politics has to take second to common sense and following the law. And yes, I'm a law and order kind of guy. If you didn't get that yet, I hope you get it now. So next question. Our schools are locked. You must press a doorbell to get in. Is this safe? Um, well, every school should have a capture system. So every school that we work with, including the district that I was with in the last two, two days up in uh, Long Island, we're building capture. We're having them build capture systems. So capture system um, basically is a... Um, is two sets of electronic doors. And those doors um, are on a single circuit system. And once someone comes in, the office staff has to uh, verify who they are through video and identity. Because anyone coming into a school that's not staff or students, including parents and school board members, should have to show a photo ID. Otherwise, they shouldn't be allowed in. And a capture system captures them between these two doors and doesn't let them out. And uh, for those of you saying, well, they'll shoot the, through the glass. Tempered glass is not easy to shoot through. I'm going to tell you that right now. And secondly, it's not like the movies. And secondly, it gives a delay long enough to protect people, long enough for police to, get, to arrive. So um, capture systems are very, very important. And showing photo ID is a necessary requirement. Any school, private or public, that is not doing that should be ashamed of themselves should be ashamed, so. 
What should a school do when parents refuse to allow full assessment of their special needs students? Well, first of all, it's very simple, and we teach this to school officials, and we tell them you have to be ethical about this, and you have to you can't abuse this. Um, when you when you don't allow your child to be assessed, uh, that falls under child endangerment because you are affecting your child's mental health. Um, so we what we tell school officials to do is take this, the the um, parent or guardian to uh, local court for child endangerment. And normally what happens is they uh, back down, they allow the child to be assessed, and the child gets the services that they need. Um, and, and if that sounds too aggressive to some of you, um, listen, uh, you send your child late to school, you don't send your child at all, uh, you don't allow your child to be assessed for their health, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, you're a bad parent in my opinion, and you are hurting your child for the rest of their life. And that's my personal and professional opinion. I have no problem taking uh, parents to court, especially for lateness and absenteeism. Uh, you have to put the hammer down. You have to set an example. You will behave yourself. You will be a good parent. We will parent for you. Um, and uh, that's important. And the problem is a lot of times local communities do not have the political will to stand up to this. And so that's that's my answer to this. So. Next question. To what extent is a school's lack of oversight over student substance abuse a factor of liability? What, uh, read that again, I'm sorry. To what extent is a school's lack of oversight over student substance abuse a factor of liability? Well, uh, that falls under child endangerment laws. And, and by the way, I, I forgot to mention this. I apologize. Um, all states have special laws for workers in uh, LEAs, in educational environments. And, and to paraphrase, um, if you are a worker in a school environment, you are held to a higher standard of child endangerment law than a regular civilian. So um, I use this a lot when I'm dealing with school uh, when teacher union officials say my teachers are not security people and I say well the state says they have a responsibility to protect these children from harm so in essence they do have to cooperate with the school safety plan um, so that that's very very important um, but the issue of substance abuse um, they're required to know that because there's a health uh, there's health policy related to child endangerment in these uh, federal laws too, because that's all part of, of special education too. So I would say that, you know, school's lack of oversight of, of substance abuse that they know of, well, that's child endangerment, plain and simple, so. Oh, and by the way, can I say something, Laura? I, I finally found all the questions. Someone said something about uh, tempered glass can be shot through with one round, and, and I agree with that. However, in a capture system, you take the glass that's in the capture system and there's a film, protective film, almost like what you put on the front of your cell phone. And it actually um, slows down that process so that one shot does not penetrate the glass. But here's the deal. The capture system generally is for people without firearms who are just aggressive, like an aggressive parent, and that does protect staff and students. If they do have a firearm, it delays them and it allows you uh, precious moments to do the lockdown, to do the escape, uh, to do uh, precious moments to allow the police to arrive for an SRO to react or respond. So <clears throat> I wanted to clarify that uh, with that question. So what's our next one? Are metal detectors and armed police in schools in violation of special ed laws? Uh, no, and, and Sarah, the company that, that I run, we are all in agreement and have been from day one because my education division is all, all my um, executives are uh, retired school administrators, really top-notch people. And we, we have always had the position that metal detectors do not belong in schools. First of all, um, if you look at the data, you'll find that metal detectors generally catch kids 
who are carrying knives to protect themselves from bullying and gangs. So you're not catching the perpetrators. Um, secondly, I, I just don't believe, as a former high school teacher, uh, that you should have a metal detector in a school. Uh, that just that just, in my mind, creates uh, the wrong atmosphere. And frankly, it can be done without metal detectors. We, we train people to do this all the time, to detect weapons on someone in literally seconds. Uh, we've been doing that for 20 years. It works very well. You can take an average person in a school environment, and we test them, and they always get it. It's a, 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 he's carrying uh, on that side. He's carrying a semi-automatic. Uh, she's carrying a revolver. He's carrying a knife. We, we teach this all the time. So we're not, we're not fans of that. Does a, does a metal detector violate special ed laws? No. Do armed police in school violate special ed laws? Absolutely not. There's no, there's no, uh, connection there. So that's my answer to that. So next question. I am a security engineer who acts on the physical environment. What are the top three or so items from a physical, electronic, environmental perspective that could have mitigated an active shooter incident? Okay. Um, so, first of all, and, and, and to the person who asked that question, uh, I think his name is Jim, don't get mad at me. We are not big fans of security equipment. We believe that's secondary. So let me explain what I, what I mean by that. A camera does not have cognitive function and peripheral vision. A camera cannot, in a school, stop a crime because nobody's monitoring it and, and uh, nobody has the time to monitor it, generally speaking. Um, does it have value? Of course cameras have value. Uh, do alarms have value? Of course they have value. But what we're big fans of is the capture system um, using a physical barrier to keep people uh, from entering the school environment. Secondly, we believe very strongly in getting rid of metal keys. It is 2018. I know it's expensive, but pass keys, uh, the swipe cards are very important, and I'm going to tell you why swipe cards are important. First of all, it allows you to electronically lock a door. It tells you when a door is ajar. Um, it allows you to control every exit an entry point of that school facility, and even uh, it, it will allow you to say, well, the teacher cards will only work up till 7.30 p.m. They don't work again until 5.30 in the morning. You, you literally can control your whole building electronically, and we're big fans of that uh, because the propping open of doors is a very serious issue. Um, and so, you know, in, in – as far as your question about the, the physical electronic environment, uh, we like uh, motion sensor spotlights. They're inexpensive and we love them on the outside of the facility. Reduces negative behavior, graffiti, all sorts of issues. Uh, we love the capture system. We love electronic pass systems. So that would be my answer to that. Why is codependency in the family a bad thing for the school shooters profiled? Well, codependency is something that um, really has, has become an issue, a dramatic issue in families in the last 40 years. And, I, and because of the work that I've been doing, um, you know, I see it as a direct uh, causation to this. What you have more and more, and you hear this from teachers, you hear it from principals, Literally every week we hear this. Uh, arrested development. So what codependency causes is arrested development. So you have you have 17 year olds who don't date. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I was 17, I, I had a girlfriend. Um, most people dated, um, you know, and I'm a little older, but um, they don't date. Uh, they don't they don't date till they're much later on in their 20s, depending on their social economic status. Um, they tend to go around in groups. Uh, they're getting their driver's license at a later time. Basically, they're delaying adulthood and responsibility and development. And so what happens is that we find that uh, many of these children are growing up in single-parent families where you have a mother. Uh, in me most cases, There's and the father is just not there. Uh, and by the way, that father that's not connected in, uh, those are wealthy families, upper middle class, middle. It's all races. It is not one group. We're seeing it constantly. 
these kids become uh, codependent, really uh, unhealthy relationships with mothers. The mothers are very clingy, uh, very controlling. Um, and what happens is the child is not developing. They're not developing at the age they're supposed to be. We see it a lot with males. And there's more than enough research about this. This is not just my ideas on this. This is, this is well documented. It's a serious problem in our society. So codependency is a, is a bad thing. But in the case of Cruz, he was protected by his mother. Excuses were made. He was committing felony assaults um, on, on children, on babies, on his mother, on other children throughout his life, and nobody was intervening uh, except to take him to therapists who were making excuses for bad behavior and trying to, to correct him, um, you know, and they, they were failing. So that's my, that's my, uh, my answer to that. Are there practical ways to ensure federal law regarding special education is enforced? Well, yes. Um, number one, uh, to read IDEA, it's not complicated. The basics, the fundamentals. And um, also, uh, the law is very clear. Um, if you write a letter, a written letter, uh, typed, dated, and signed, and you send it certified mail, uh, or deliver it in person to the principal, uh, they are required, the school system is required to act on that request to have the child assessed. So that's number one. Number two is to ask the simple question, have you had a, a federal level climate assessment done of your special education department? And I'm going to tell you the answer you're going to get. What is that? And right there you know that they're not doing their job. And then thirdly is um, what are the issues related to the special ed department of that school. Well, that's easy to find. You go on PACER, you look up all the cases involving that school system. If you see all those cases uh, and you start digging a little bit, you're gonna find that those student with special needs. Most of these legal cases with students are special needs in, in our experience. So those are the ways to find out if they're enforcing it. Next question. Okay, this is the last question we have time for. How do you protect the okay. campus school with wide perimeter and separate buildings? Okay. How do, how do you protect the perimeter? Yes, the campus the school with a wide perimeter and separate buildings. Very, very simple. Uh, you're going to have to have somebody uh, trained with a two-way radio. Um, you know, I was at a school two days ago that had nine acres of property. And most of that was just uh, different sports fields, football, soccer, that kind of thing. Um, what the school district did, and it's not a big school district, they had their own internal security team. And they had two security people that did a roving patrol all day, every day. Uh, they had one, they have one at night that works till two in the morning. So the property is, is driven around on a, they drive around an electric golf cart, which is very, uh, which is very quiet. Um, and they drive around with their two-way radios. They have direct access to police, and they, um, they monitor the facility. Uh, either you have staff members volunteer to do that, which is what we do. We get volunteers to do it. It always works. Or you hire people to do that. Um, it's pretty simple stuff. You have to keep the bad thing from coming inside, and the only way to do that is to monitor and look for the bad thing, especially at middle schools, by the way. And I'm going to tell you something that shocks people, but middle schools, you will find the most problems with uh, pedophiles and hebephiles, uh, child sex offenders, uh, adult sex offenders of children. Uh, they will sit outside of middle schools because that's the age group they love. And uh, I, I can't even count how many times school officials, when we've asked them to try, have found uh, these sex offenders on probation sitting in their cars doing really bad things uh, at the beginning and the end of the school day watching children of that age. Middle school is a very, very important that you have the, the walk-arounds, so. Thank you for answering all those questions. All unanswered questions will be forwarded to Dale and he will reach out to you individually to answer them. Please remember that if you are applying for CLA credit, you must have attended for the full 90 minutes of the presentation. 
You are also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. In addition to being your best source for testifying and consulting experts for the past 60 years, PASA also offers free interactive webinars, expert written articles, research reports on expert witnesses such as the Challenge History Report 2.0 and the Expert Profile 360. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for attending and most especially Dale Yeager for his time and effort in creating this presentation. If you would like to speak with Dale or if you would like to speak with a TASA representative regarding an expert witness for a case you are working on, please contact TASA 1-800-523-2319. One of my colleagues will be following up with you regarding your feedback on today's presentation. This concludes our program for today.